day that the Lord has made, we will and shall rejoice and be glad in it. Again, we'd like to welcome you to the First Providence Missionary Baptist Church, where Reverend Darrell Jones is our pastor. My name is Minister Keith Haygood, and I will be leading us in our Sunday school lesson tonight. And I pray that you've done what I asked you to do on, on Sunday to get into chapter 16 of Genesis. But we will go through it briefly tonight. We'll run through it right quick tonight uh, where we could get our understanding to get us to where we need to be. Uh, we're going to be moving fast, so I ask that you just stay with me. I'll try to read as much scripture as I can, and we'll try to move forward in that direction. But I pray that all is well with you and that God is continuing to bless you as we started this new year. We also just like to pray that we'll continue to look and consider all of our sick and shut in. So before we get into the word of God, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again in the most ominous manner we know how. We come thanking you, Father, for allowing us to be here this afternoon to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, we pray that you just allow us and go with us as we go through this lesson. And Father, we pray that you would just make it plain and simple. So give us the wisdom, the knowledge, as well as the understanding that this lesson will be brought forward with complete clarity. And Lord, please, please, sir, allow us to apply this lesson to our life as we live this life that we're living. And we just want to thank you, Father, knowing that you're worthy. You're worthy because you're worthy of the Lamb to do all that is asking you to do. These and all blessings we ask from your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We do give God all the praise and to Pastor Jones and Minister Strong and Minister Darrell Jones, as well as Deacon Clifton Lewis, uh, who also shares with us during our Sunday school teachings. And we pray once again, that all is well with you. So let us get into this lesson. And I want to quickly go to Genesis, the 16th chapter. And I want to read that to get us to where we need to be. And then as we get into that, we're going to break down our scripture in um, the 21st chapter, uh, verses 8 through 20. And we're going to look at first in those first eight to ten we're going to look at the cause of the conflict then verses 11 through 13 we're going to look at the comfort in the conflict and then the cost of the conflict in verses 14 through 16 and the provision in the conflict verses 17 through 20 uh, today's lesson is our winter quarter unit two God the source of justice and this is lesson six of January the 9th, 2022. Our devotional reading was Jeremiah 29, 10, and 14. Our background scripture was Genesis 21, 8 and 21, 8 through 21. And printed passage is Genesis 21, 8 through 20. And the lesson, title of this lesson is Improbable Hope. And we all should have hope, knowing all that what God has done for us, that when we go through things within our life, that we still can have hope. Now let us look at Genesis 16. I will be reading from the New Living Translation so it might be a little bit different than what yours might say. But we basically really going to read all 15 of these chapters, all these verses where you can get understanding. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had not been able to hear children for him, have children for him, bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. 
Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarah proposals. So Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. Now we have to look and understand that these 10 years now, Lot and Abram came out of the land of Ur. And what they did, they had different conflicts going on between their herdsmen. So they decided to separate. And Abram ended up taking Canaan. And he let Lot have the first pig. And Lot seen that water down there in the area, in the valley that he saw, and he wanted to give that. So Abram went head on and let him have that. That was his choice. But Canaan was the land they were headed for anyway. So Abram ended up getting the land that he was headed for, which was Canaan. I just want to get that point in there. So Abram had sexual relationships with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarah, with contempt. In, the, in, in a sense, she despised her. Then Sarah said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms. But now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong. You are me. Abram replied, look, she is your servant. So deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. This is the first time she, she took, took off and just ran away, been treated so bad. But notice that she the one started all of this herself. She started treating Sarah in a bad way, despising her. And it all comes down that she was disrespectful in the sense to Sarah that Sarah really just put a lot of pressure on her that she decided she wasn't going to take no more. She just didn't have hope to stay there and deal with what was going on. So she decided she was just going to get up and leave. And that's what she did. She did leave. And you'll notice this when we get into our other, our scripture for the night, that this time here, don't get this confused, because she did leave this time on her own, and she was pregnant at the time. And she took off. He said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarah. She replied, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ismael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fists against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will give in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bershel Laroa, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Berod. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ismael. Abram was 86 years old when Ismael, Ismael was born. 86 years old. Okay, that was a brief, uh, what we'll say a background 
of really what happened to get us to where we're going to be today. So I wanted you to know what all these things that occurred, even from the name Ismael, where you can know who Ismael is and what Ismael really meant. And we all can understand what happened before what's going to happen within our lesson tonight. So we're going to look at the improbable hope dealing with verses 8 through 20. Verses 8 through 20. And as I say, we will break this down into four different sections to where you could get a better understanding of what's going on with the Scripture, the Word of God. So when we look at 21 and those first eight verses uh, was dealing so much with the birth of Isaac, when she had Isaac. And that's what was going on there, dealing with the uh, uh, circumcision and those things that going on, being weaned at the time. Uh, he was going through that process of what a newborn baby had to go through. And that's what was dealing with, with those first eight verses. But then when we get to verse 8, and uh, we want to look at verse 8 through 10, and let's see what that's saying. This will be dealing with the cause of the conflict. So let us look at verse number 8 to verse number 10. It says, When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ismael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant, Hagar, making fun of her son, Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. I won't have it. That's what was going on in those verses. Now, now let's look at that. That's, that's what caused <laughs> this whole conflict. Now, they were just, uh, Ismael was just picking at Isaac, just, just having fun at him, just, just messing with him, and she just didn't like that. That just ticked her slap off. So when we look at the cause of the conflict, it says when Genesis 21 opens, a feast is being held to celebrate the weaning of Isaac. Children tended to nurse longer in those days, so Isaac may have been as old as three or four years old when he was finally weaned. The enjoyment of the day was interrupted when Sarah observed Ismael mocking his little brother. Though Ismael's behavior seemed questionable, we must recognize that for the past 13 years, he had been the only child of an aging man who desperately wanted children. Abraham was a very wealthy and a very powerful man. And Ismael had enjoyed a privileged childhood that he now had to share with a brother. Now, he had everything. He had the love of his father. There was nobody else. And, and him and his father just did different things together. He worked with them. But now there is another son. And as it says to us, he might have been around uh, three to four years old at this time that this thing was going on. So he was a little bit older. And it still was a big difference between the ages. Or as it says, Ismael was 13. But it didn't give the direct age of Isaac, but it said he, he was really somewhere around three and four years old at this time that he was weaned. And then it says, Sarah demanded that Abraham cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son. That was in verse 10 when it talks about that inheritance that he won't uh, get these inheritance. Uh, it's only going to be for her son. That is, we're not going to be sharing those inheritance. It was just going to be for her son. Though her motivation was wrong, 
Sarah was absolutely right on one key point. Ismael was not the child of promise. It was Isaac whom God had promised would bring Abraham a line of descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky. Ismael was not the result of God's supernatural movement in the life of Abraham. He was the result of impatient and self-indulgence of the part of Sarah and Abraham. Isaac, not Ismael, was God's choice. They tried to just maneuver this thing. They tried to go against what God had said. When she came, when Sarah, Sarah came and she gave Hagar to Abraham, and they just tried to alter the plans of God. And that's something that we need to understand. We, we don't need to try to alter God's plan. God's plans need to run their course. And we need to be patient in the sense where they were impatient and they wanted to indulge on their own self of what they wanted to be. And we just can't work things out that way. One thing about it, God is not happy with it. And God is not going to ordain it. So this happened, and God allowed it to, ha allowed it to happen, but that was a part of, not a part of God's plan. That was not what God had wanted to happen. Or if he wanted to happen that way, that would have been the end of it right then. You know? But when he said that Sarah was going to conceive and have a child, you remember, you remember that the three uh, angels of the Lord, they came there and they said that and she laughed. And really she came out and, 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 and in a sense lied to them and said uh, that she didn't laugh, but she did laugh. But that starts a lot of that problem with that conflict as well. So that's the conflict. Now we want to look at the comfort in the conflict. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. 11 through 13. And it reads, This upset Abraham very much because Ismael was his son. But God told Abraham, Do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you. For Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. Now God assured him. Now here he had raised Ismael 13. You, you, you done had a son. You done raised 13. He's 13 years old. You done fell in love with this kid. You know, and now she wants them all to just go and just, just, to, just, to, just to leave there. And he, he didn't really take that too well to say that they got to go. But as he had said to her, and, and I told you to look at that in the 16th chapter when he talked to uh, Sarah when she wanted to make that move to do what she was going to do, he told her, that's yours. You the mistress, that's your choice. You do it how you want to do it. And the same thing here. He was not wanting to accept what she wanted to do, but the Lord came and talked to him and told him to do as what Sarah has said. So he, he, he got the assurance to know that Isaac was the son of choice, but Ismael as well would be blessed because he was Abraham's son. So he was going to be blessed as well. So that's dealing with the comfort in the conflict of him knowing that everything was going to be all right, that they was going to be blessed, they were going to be taken care of, and still, he didn't have a lot of joy of his 13-year-old son to leave him. Because you know I said earlier that he wanted to have children. He just had the desire to just have children. But he was not able to have so many children. But God did bless him later on. And you know, and sometimes we have difficult times. God has asked us to do certain things within our life and sometimes we just don't do it you know and and and, and we think about it we, we 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 try to deal with it we try to put it on the table and try to come up with a answer for it but that ain't the way to go by handling things that God has 
desire for you to do. You need to pray about that thing. And most of all, you need to be obedient to the will of God and do that what is asking you to do. And we need to get out of this stuff about, well, I want to do it my way. It ain't got nothing to do with how you want to do it. It's how God wants it to be done. And that's how we need to go about doing it. And we need to be thankful that even God chooses us to do the things that we do. Because he could go and choose somebody else. But when he chose you to do certain things, you ought to feel glad about that. You ought to rejoice about that. And you ought to be obedient to do what the Lord will have you to do. Okay. Now let's just look at the cost of the conflict. Verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. The cost of the conflict. It says, so Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with her son, in a sense, their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Then, then it says, when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. And the cost that we have to deal with, the cost we have to pay for the things that we do within our life, and that's something, too, when we deal with sin, we have to deal with the consequences of sin. And that's the cost that you have to pay for your disobedience. So if you want to disobey, you're going to have to get to the point where you're going to have to deal with the cost for what you did for the consequences of sin. But it says the cost of the conflicts. He said, after receiving provisions from Abraham, bread and water, Hagar and her son, left the safety of the tents of Abraham and headed off into the desert. Instead of heading west into Egypt, now we know she was a Egyptian, but she didn't go back to Egypt. It said instead of heading west into Egypt, Hagar and Ishmael traveled east into the wilderness of Beersheba. Soon enough, the water Hagar received from Abraham ran out, and she and Ismael faced a slow and agonizing death by dehydration. Unwilling to watch her son die, Hagar moved a bow shot away from her son and began to cry. There's no hope. She couldn't see no hope at this time. But she just did not want to see her son die. She didn't want to see it. So she went about 100 yards away. And it says a bow throw away. So what an arrow can shoot over, she went that away. But she put her son up underneath a bush for him to lay there and die. And she left and went over there and cried. And that's what we have to deal with sometimes with the consequences of some of the things that we have to deal with within this life that we live in. And it's a cost for some of the things that we have to do and some of the things that we have to put up with. But we need to be thankful that God did pay it all. And all to him we do owe. But he did pay everything. He paid the ultimate when he gave the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. So that was the cost of the conflict in verses 14 through 16. And now finally, let's look at the provision in the conflict. Verses 17 through 20. The provision in the conflict. And it reads, But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation 
from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer and settled in the wilderness of Haran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. You look at, she arranged for him to marry a woman from Egypt. Now you notice she was an Egyptian herself. And this is a lot of that when you see the separation of dad and, 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 and early as it talked about in that chapter 16 about what Ismail became of. He, he was a rowdy, rowdy young man, you know. But God still blessed him in a mighty way because he had some descendants and, and many descendants. But he was a rough fellow, but God still looked out for him. So the provisions in the conflict, God had not abandoned Hagar or her son. Through his, through his angel, God addresses Hagar by name. He called her by her name. He said he knows her and he knows all about her troubles. God is the same way with us. He knows us. He knows the strings of our head. He knows all about us. He knows the troubles that we're dealing with within our life. God knows everything about us only through our relationship with him. God knows what we're going through. He knows what we're dealing with. She, she is called to trust God. Fear not, she is told. God has heard the voice of the lad. The same God who heard her voice years ago, back in chapter 16, assures her that he now hears Ismael's voice. You notice he said, I have heard the lad. He was calling out. He was crying. He heard the lad, even though she was crying as well. But, but God told her, tells her that I heard the lad. I heard him crying, and he answered his prayer. God responds when someone cries out from a situation of helplessness and hopelessness. God hears our cries. He knows what we're going through, and he will answer by and by. That's a lot to be thankful for. God renews his promise regarding Ismael's descendants becoming a nation. It is only when Hagar obeys God that she sees a well from which she can draw the water to sustain both of them. God's blessings to her was made evident in a real and needed way. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, or whatever is asked of him to do. The account ends with the indication that God's promise had been fulfilled. Ismael's future had been accurately prophesied. His descendants, the Arabian nomads, or Bedouins, indeed roamed the wives of the desert. Ismael himself becomes an archer and a skillful hunter who would be more than able to kill game for food and be a formidable opponent to any human enemy. So he was blessed in a mighty way, and he was one of God's descendants that did grow, and he did a lot of stuff, as I said earlier, a lot of evil things within his life. So we got to continue to have hope and all that we go through. Sometimes we think things might be helpless, that there's no help, there's no way out, there's no hope. We just don't see how we're going to deal with it. But God will put us in a situation that he will give us peace, he will give us rest, and most of all, he will give us understanding. They were both to the point that they were ready to give up on really living. Uh, Ismael and Hagar but God looked beyond their faults and he saw their needs and that's how God deal with us 
There's not in a situation that we cannot have hope. Because God would always look beyond our faults. Because he already knows our need. He knows what we need even before we come asking. So we're dealing with tonight improbable hope. Well, we ought to be thankful that we even have that little dash of hope. As long as you got that, that means that you're starting, that there's a chance that something can change within your life. So we're dealing with things, conflicts, and things within our life, but God is still able. He's there for us. He said to us that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So we got to continue to put our trust in him. And finally, I want to look at the liberating of this lesson. It says, very often when we are feeling isolated, hurt, or even victimized. It is difficult to remember that the God we serve is omnipotent. He's omnipresent and he's omnipotent. He knows everything that is going on in our lives. He knows when we are hurt and he knows who is hurting us. Our faith demands that we trust him to reconcile every situation in his appointed time. God is everywhere, all the time. There is no situation that we endure alone. He is available to comfort us if we ask him. God is all-powerful. When present trials make us anxious or fearful, we must remember that the provisions for all we need rest in his hands. Christians are not immune from tests, trials, and tribulation. Nor are Christian families immune from dysfunction. Through these hardships, we must hold on to the promise and the hope that only God can provide. God will provide. God will supply our every need. If we'll just continue to put our trust in him, have faith in him, knowing that he's able to do all and above or whatever we would ask him to do. So I say to us tonight, continue to have hope. But as you have that hope, always believe that God will answer your prayer and he will take care of you because God will do what no other God is able or capable to doing. So continue to trust in him and God will. I tell you tonight, God will take care of you. We pray that something was said tonight that will bless or has blessed your soul and that you will continue to have that hope knowing that God will take care of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again. We just want to thank you, Father, for what our eyes have heard, heard, seen and our ears have heard. We thank you for allowing us to come and deal with your word tonight and we pray that all that was brought forward tonight will touch somebody's hearts and give them a better understanding of your word but lord let us all know that there is hope if we'll continue to put our trust in you and everything will work out in our favor father we also ask tonight that you continue to look down upon this first providence family continue to bless us in the blessing that we so dearly stand in the need of we pray, O oh Lord, for all the ones who are sick and shut in. We pray for all the bereaved families. And we just want to thank you for just being so good to us. And Lord, we know that you are able to do all that you say that you can do. And we will put our trust in you and knowing that you will do it. Father, these and all blessings we ask for. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Bye now.